Well, the flight to nowhere sold out in 10 minutes. Qantas Airlines called it their fastest selling ticket in the airline's history. Cheap seats went for 575 bucks. First class went for 2675 And what does a passenger get for the money? Seven hours of circling Australia, landing in the same place you left. Chalk it up to COVID-19. People are weary of being stuck at home. In response to months of going nowhere, they paid good money to, well, go nowhere. Forgive me for being blunt, but I'm going to keep my money in my pocket and keep my feet on the ground. Flying in circles? No, thank you. Flying toward a destination? That's better. And that's biblical. Embedded and inherent in the biblical teaching in the pages of Scripture is this promise that we are headed to a better place. That we're not going to circle around and come back to where we've always been. And we can survive winter times like the one in which we find ourselves now because we know that a glorious springtime a glory awaits us. The book we're studying, the book of Esther, invites this hope. It may surprise you to hear the book of Esther described as a book that gives hope about the end of history. When we think of end times, we often think of prophetic books like the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, the teachings of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. So does the story of the queen of Persia, the book of Esther, does it does it contribute to this what's next conversation? I would say yes. Esther is a foreshadowing of final events. It does relate the history of exiled Jews in 5th century BC Persia. But it also reminds us of the timeline of humanity in human history. If you need to widen the aperture of your lens of Scripture, back away for a bit and look at the big picture of the book of Esther, and you will see how the three acts of Esther mirror the three acts of human history. Here's a review of the three acts of Esther. Act number one is crisis. Crisis. The early chapters introduce us to the crisis in the nation of Persia in the city of Susa. The curtain of our drama opens onto this flamboyant display of wealth. King Xerxes had everything. He had power. He had money. He had wine. He had women. Well, all but the one woman that mattered. Queen Vashti refused to come into his man caves, camp man cave, and dance around in front of a bunch of bibulous males. For that reason, she got the boot. The, es the exit of Vashti triggered the entrance of Esther. And she had enough woo, she had enough wow that she won the heart of the king and inherited the throne of the queen. But there was a secret. She was a Jew. And her cousin, Mordecai, the other main character in the story, who worked in the palace, was also a Jew. And no one knew. King Xerxes did not know that he slept with a Jew and employed a Jew. And they probably never would have known, except for the villain of the story, Haman, who happened to be a Jew hater. And when Mordecai refused to bow before Haman, Haman convinced the king, King Xerxes, to exterminate every Jew in the Persian Empire. It was a crisis. And the crisis of Act 1 led to the confusion of Act 2. 
having decreed certain deaths for the Jews, the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. The king and his right-hand man were so insensitive and so unaware of the value of people that they could declare a bloodbath and then have a cocktail. The entire city of Susa was bewildered, not just the Jewish nation, but the entire city. I mean, if Haman can turn his ire on an ethnic group, a minority group, well, who's next? He may have it in for people who are left-handed, for farmers. So the entire nation was on edge. When the king is a wimp, and his chief of staff is a despot, anything can happen. Of course, you and I know something that the people of Persia did not. We've read the story. We know the story, and we know that God was busy at work. He was working behind behind the scenes, and out of this confusion came Act 3, and that is conquest. That's what we looked at last week. The tables were turned. Haman's plot crashed into the head first into into God's providence. No one, not even the king of Persia, can stand against our king, the king of kings. Mordecai got this. Somewhere he got this. He came to understand. Remember his wake-up call to Queen Esther? He said, now, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise. It will arise from another place. That's what he told her. He was absolutely certain of the ultimate victory of God's plan. And there was no question to Mordecai as to the outcome of the story. Yes, there was a crisis. Yes, there is confusion. But overall, Mordecai could see the conquest. He, he knew his God was a covenant-keeping God. I don't know where he got this. Maybe he returned to the teachings of the youth and of his youth, and he was reminded. He knew God would be their God and they would be his people. He knew God would gather them from all the countries. He knew God would send a king through them and to them from the tribe of Judah to rescue his people and establish his eternal kingdom. These were the covenants that God had made. And Mordecai came to believe that somehow God will keep this covenant. And maybe he'll use Esther, but if Esther refuses, he'll find another way. The role of Esther was questionable, but the promise of God was not. The perseverance of God's children was never in question. Consequently, the victory was theirs. And we know the story. We know that Esther did get on on board. We know that that day that was certain to be a day of death in which all the people all the Jewish people would be destroyed, turned into a day of victory in which all their enemies were destroyed. And the Jews who had lived in fear all of a sudden stood in strength. They who were in a, a minority, a relegated minority to the margins of society, all of a sudden were center stage. And all the other nationalities were looking up to them. And two Jews, Mordecai and Esther, were right in the heartbeat of the palace. It's no wonder that Jews to this day celebrate this triumph with the Feast of Purim, which we'll examine in detail next week. But there's more to this story than Hebrew victory. Don't let this account, the book of Esther, be simply a history book of what God did. It is actually a playbook of what God is doing. And the three acts of Esther mirror the three acts of Esther. Humanity. Let me show you what I mean. There was Act 1, a crisis. A crisis. Haman entered the world of Persia. Not, I'm sorry, he entered the world of Persia as an advisor to the king. Our Haman, Satan, entered the Garden of Eden as a tempter to Adam and Eve. Now, the Garden of Eden was perfect. God found it so delightful that he would walk with his children in the cool of the evening. Can you believe that? Adam and Eve found it so safe they wore no clothing. Why would they? What they 
What did they have to hide and from whom did they need to hide? They were one with creation. They were one with God. They were one with each other. It was a wonderful world. But then came the crisis. Adam and Eve broke rank. The wooing serpent whispered a better deal. I can get you more, he said. More power. More clout. Why, in my plan, you'll occupy the corner office of the universe. Here's what he said to them. You'll be like God. And that's all it took. Eve took the bait. Adam followed. Now, Eve was perfect. Eve got, I'm sorry, (laughs) Eden was perfect. Eden offered everything that they would ever need to know. Everything that they would ever need to have. Ecological harmony, relational purity, spiritual peace. Eden offered everything. But there could be more, whispered the Satan. And he whispers it still. And so, crisis. Crisis came into the garden. And that crisis of Act 1 led to the confusion of Act 2. That's where we are right now, ladies and gentlemen. We are in Act 2. The world is a confused mess. Adam and Eve, as a response to the crisis, hid. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They went into hiding They hid first. We've all been hiding since. They hid behind fig leaves and in the forest. We hide behind bottles of liquor or desks of work. We distance ourselves from our only hope, and that is our good and our faithful God. Even creation is cranky. Thorns and thistles, which were unknown in the Garden of Eden, they wormed their way into the creation. And nature gives food, but only in exchange for the sweat and toil of Adam and Eve and their children. It's a mess. It's a mess. Adam and Eve had two sons. Both brought offerings to God. God accepted the offering of the younger, Abel, But he rejected the gift of Cain, the elder, and Cain was upset. So Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And for the first time, the blood of a person was spilled onto the soil of earth. How many drops of blood have been spilled since? All the wars, all the murders, all the fights, all the conflicts all the bitterness, all the hostilities, all the rivalries, squabbles and scourges. At one point, the Lord heaves this heavy sigh, and he was sorry that he had made man on the earth, the saddest sentence in Scripture. He started over with a flood, hoping the flood would clean everything up but the descendants of Noah went to Babel and they built a tower still heeding the serpent's temptation that they could be like God and the result was and the result is babbling corruption runs riot sometimes it seems that Haman and Xerxes are still in charge but they're not they're not how do we know Because we've read the book. We know the difference. We know that our covenant-keeping God is at work. And just as Mordecai heard promises and they gave him faith, today we hear promises and they convince us that we're not on a flight to nowhere, but we're on a flight to somewhere that is unlike anything we have ever seen. And soon to come is Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Act 3, and that is the conquest. 
the conquest. It's right to see God as a loving father. It is right to see him as a caring shepherd. It is right to see him as a friend of sinners. But it is equally right to see him as the conquering king in the end of history. Who will once and for all do away with Satan, with Satan and everybody who has saluted him. He was decisive and dramatic in the days of Esther. He'll be even more so in these, the last days. Let me tell you what his, history's next big event is. Best I can determine. The next big event in history is a moment in which God will rapture. He will, how long is the twinkle of an eye? Somebody tell me. Well, that's how long Jesus needs to inaugurate the final era, the era of conquest. Now, think for a moment about the implications of this sudden rapture. Think for a moment what this planet is going to be like with all of a sudden every God-fearing, Bible-believing, Christ-following son or daughter of God mysteriously gone. Can you imagine the chaos? Can you imagine the questions? Every NGO will close. Christian schools will be empty. Christian lawyers, doctors, researchers, professors, all gone. The salt and light of society will be withdrawn. And the stage will be set for the master of deception. Scripture calls him the Antichrist. The Antichrist. The stage will be set for him to step into the void and offer answers and solutions, just like Adolf Hitler emerged on the scene of such political and economic chaos that entire nations of people bought his lies. So the Antichrist will step forward with pragmatic answers and promises to unite the world. He will use oratory. He will use satanic power. He will offer easy solutions and make exorbitant pledges. He will inaugurate his era with diplomacy. The Old Testament prophet Daniel says that leader will make a firm agreement with many people for seven years. He will extend an olive branch to the nations. Most specifically, he will make an agreement with the nation of Israel. And Israel will agree. They will sign the treaty. Yet midway through the treaty, he will break it. And guess what will break loose? All hell. And he will cause astounding devastation and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. In the book of Revelation, chapters 4 through 19, we have a description of everything that's going to happen in the second half of this tribulation. It will be unlike anything that the world has ever seen. Famine, death, cosmic disturbances. J. Dwight Pentecost was right when he wrote, No passage can be found to alleviate to any degree whatsoever the severity of this time that shall come upon the earth. The tribulation shall be the darkest hour in human history. In your heart, you should thank the Lord Jesus right now that you will not be here to be a part of it. Such a depressing chapter of human history, unlike anything that the world has ever seen. But I'm not finished. There is more news, good news, good news to share. Because at the end of this time of terrible tribulation, there will be a battle, a final battle in the valley of Armageddon. And in that battle, the Antichrist will rally his troops to fight against the Lord Jesus and his army. Revelation 19 and verse 19. The Antichrist and his armies will suffer total and cataclysmic defeat at the hand of our King, Jesus Christ. And Jesus won't even lift a finger. 
He won't even lift a finger. Revelation 19, 15 says the sword of his word will smite the nations. As was prophesied in the book of Daniel, the Antichrist will be destroyed, but not by human power. The expression of Haman alive in the tribulation will be defeated just as Haman was defeated in the days of Esther. Satan will be chained and Jesus will return to the earth as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to judge, to judge once and for all his enemies, Satan's deception. And he will set up a kingdom on this earth just as he has promised he will. Hear me, church. Our God will have his garden of Eden. And he will set up a thousand-year reign in which he will keep every covenant, in which he will display what he can do, in which his people will reign with him, in which there will be peace, in which there will be no racism, no pandemics, in which there will be no more murders, no more evil. There will be peace on this earth. Every covenant made by God will be kept. And at the end of those thousand years, Satan will be released and he will attempt one final coup. But once again, he will be defeated and he will be cast into an eternal fire that was created for the devil and his angels. And the world will be judged and the eternal kingdom of heaven will begin. So what's next? I'll tell you what's next. Victory is what's next. The conquest conquest of Almighty God is what's next. Peace and harmony. For the child of God, there is no reason to fear. There is no reason to fear. You can have security about the victory. Yes, there was a crisis. Absolutely, we're in the midst of confusion. But you can set your heart on the coming conquest and what happened as described in the book of Esther is being played out right now in the history of mankind we are in the era of confusion would anyone doubt that we are so confused people all around us have no clue why they are on this earth or where they are headed Ask most people, and they will tell you we're on a flight to nowhere. We're on a flight to nowhere. So you might as well have a lot of drinks before the plane lands because we're not destined anywhere. The invisible enemy of sin and secularism has left us dazed and bewildered. Even the brightest and best thinkers on our planet are absolutely clueless as to what comes next. We have much no how, hardly any no why. That's why we're so confused. That's why we take it out on each other. That's why there's such bitterness and rancor. That's why there's such territorialism and politicizing over everything. We're down deep scared. We're just scared. But in the midst of all the chaos and in the midst of all the fear, there is a group of people who has read the book, who has acknowledged, yes, there was a crisis, who is acknowledging, yes, this is a time of confusion, but who is standing on the firm hope that a conquest is coming because our covenant-keeping God has never broken a promise. Hence, the church. Hence, the church. That's why we're here. To be the salt and the light. To be that quorum of people who don't cave in, who don't drink the Kool-Aid of fear. To be that group of people who behave like that church behaved on that Sunday morning in London. No one would have blamed that church had they not gathered. The night before... Hitler's bombing 
raid had roared through the city all night long. That morning, that Sunday morning, London was a circle of fire. Walls were shattered. Buildings were destroyed. Even the walls of this particular congregation in downtown London were reduced to rubble. There was no roof. But still they came. Members arrived to find their pews covered with rocks and dust. But rather than despair, you know what they did? They chose to worship They stood in the center of what had been their building and they began to sing standing on stones. They sang the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by spirit and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Can you envision this circle of brave souls? They set their faith on our unfailing God, even smack dab in the center of global chaos they worshiped. Their song was an admonition of sorts, a declaration of truth in the midst of a failing society. And that song may very well have saved the life of a young American reporter by the name of Ben Patterson. He had arrived in London the day before Of all days, he spent the night in a hotel with a pillow over his head, hearing the sirens, hearing the air raids, hearing the collapsing buildings, hearing the screams of the wounded. He said at one point, he prayed, if this is what modern civilization has brought us, then God, let me die. At some point, he dozed off. And he awoke to the unexpected sound of a singing church. And he climbed out of the bed and he opened his window and he looked out and he saw that congregation gathered in the midst of the rubble. He later wrote these words. Suddenly, I saw something in the world that was untouchable something that had endured through the millennia, something that was indestructible, the spirit and life and power of Jesus within his church. Friends, bombs are still dropped. Walls still collapse. Worlds still are on edge. Pandemics still rage. But in the midst of it all, guess what? God has his people. God has his people. God has his people who show up, who stand up, and who look up. And sometimes they gather in rooms and wear masks. Sometimes they stay home, though they would much rather gather in rooms. But they come. They stand in the presence of God, in the midst of a society that's gone crazy. They keep looking forward. Why? Because they've read the end of the story. They know it's confusion. They're not surprised at the chaos. Troubled, yes. Discouraged. Fatigued, no doubt. But they don't give up. Many years ago, I attended a San Antonio Spurs basketball game. It was the final game of the regular season. And it was unique. It was unique because the outcome of the game did not matter. The Spurs had had a terrific season, and they had already secured their spot at the top of the playoffs. They had such a lead over the second-place team that nobody could catch them. But they had to play the game because it was on the schedule. Whether they won or lost didn't matter. They couldn't lose even if they lost. The game had little or no interest to the sports world, but the preacher in me saw a sermon illustration about to happen. Christians occupy the same spot as the Spurs did. You see, folks, we've already won. We've already won. 
because of the death of Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Christ from the tomb and the guarantee of Christ to be at the throne, in the throne room of God, in the presence of the Holy Spirit around us. We cannot lose. We are guaranteed victory. No one can snatch us from our Father's hand. Yet, we still have a few contests. We still have a few events. The season's not quite over. So how do we behave in the meantime? Well, I watched the Spurs to see if they could say anything, teach me anything. Here's what they did. They showed up. They played hard. They had a great time. And they killed the opposition. Even in the post-game interview, Popovich said, I've never seen them so relaxed. You know, something happens when you know you're going to win. You play harder. You show up. You stay strong. Friend, I encourage you to do the same. In these last days, just show up. Play hard. Have some fun. Stay happy. And be assured that the King of Kings will keep his covenant. And will have his conquest. Amen. We bless you, Lord, for the picture of the end of times as you describe it. And we thank you, Lord. It excites our heart. We bless you, Father, that you have not trapped us on an airline, on a flight that has no landing or that lands in the same place it begins. Because, Lord, we're ready to, to go not to nowhere but to somewhere beyond anything that we could ever imagine. To that day we set our hearts. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.